All right, all right. Well, you are a lively bunch this morning. That's good. Is it, is it the smell of the popcorn? Uh, all right, all right. Well, look, we are starting this series, Christmas at the Movies. Um, hopefully, it's as entertaining as I hope. Um, maybe it's not even at all, and you're like, please don't ever do that again by the time we get to the end of December. But we had a great time on Wednesday. We have 30, 30 seats in a, we have a little theater downstairs, it's pretty cool, and we have 30 seats in that theater, and 29 seats were filled. And so that was really fun. It was really, really fun, and we, we watched Home Alone, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So in the weeks to come, next week, Roger is graciously going to be bringing the message and so for Thanksgiving, and then the following Sunday, we'll go into our next movie, which is my favorite childhood movie. Um, the Charlie Brown Christmas. Thank you, thank you. But we're not going to have a movie night for that because it's only 25 minutes. And so what you might do is we might watch it prior to the service Sunday morning. I'm not sure yet, trying to figure out logistics with the choir, um, but maybe we'll watch it. Then we're going to do The Grinch with Jim Carrey, and we will have a movie night with that on December 6th. And then we're going to finish with my all-time favorite Christmas movie, Elf. Um, <laughs> which we'll watch on December 13th. And we might need to do sign-ups, starting with the Grinch, to see if we're going to fill up more than 30 and have two showings in our theater. I mean, how amazing is that? The 6 o'clock show and then the late show at 8, for those of us who are in bed by 9, right? Um, and so that we'll see where we go with all of this. But I'm excited, and hopefully the movie was great fun, and hopefully um, we can draw some truth out of these. And now... Before you cast judgment early on, because I said I was going to be comparing Kevin McAllister, who is our star character in Home Alone, with Joseph of the Old Testament. Now, hopefully you're like, yeah, Tim, I can see that, versus like, what the heck? How's that even close? So we're going to try to show some similarities, but we're going to get to the main point today. And I'm going to start with the main point because I want you to know where we're going. Forgiveness and reconciliation. That's where I want to get to at the end is the significance of forgiveness, the significance of reconciliation, the difference, and then end with a, end with a passage that I think is really, really fitting for this whole thing in um, Colossians. Okay, so let's, let's have a little recap of this very, well, this is actually the highest grossing Christmas movie of all time, Home Alone. Um, and so let's have a little recap. So we have this eight-year-old kid, right? The movie opens with his house is going crazy with activity because a bunch of families who, who or a couple of families who all have a whole lot of kids each, right? They're, they're going to Paris and they're going on this trip. And, and boy, the activity in the house is crazy. And Kevin, well, he just... He's just kind of mean a little bit with what he says to his brothers and sisters initially, and his brothers and sisters surely are not nice to him, nor are his cousins. And then even Kevin maybe is a little smart mom with mom and dad, right? He kind of says what he thinks to mom and dad and says, says some things, and then after the big hubala, what's, what's the word, hubala, hubala, hoopla. <laughs> <laughs> the big hoopla in the kitchen, right, where he spills milk all over, and he's called a big or little jerk by his uncle. What a mean uncle, don't you think? Calls him a little jerk. And so mom takes him to his bedroom, and as he's standing there, he says, I hope you all just disappear. And mom says, if you say it again, maybe it'll happen. And so he says it again. I hope you all disappear. Sends him upstairs. In the morning, the power goes out, the alarms don't go off, the family gets crazy, they jump in the vans, the neighbor boy gets counted as Kevin, and they take off, don't recognize they don't have Kevin, get on a plane and start flying to Paris, and they still don't recognize they have Kevin. And then Kevin wakes up in the morning, and he goes downstairs wondering where everybody's at, and there's a scene then where he's sitting at the counter, and his initial reaction is this, like, my made my family disappear. <laughs> and that's about a three and a half second response. Because what happens next is a big smile on his face, and then he begins to have a party. Jumps up and down on mom and dad's bed with popcorn, and he is psyched and jazzed up that he is alone and having a blast. 
Now, what's intriguing in this movie, this is, I really never figured this out, but it surely isn't taking place more than 48 hours here, but this eight-year-old boy is the most resourceful and the most ingenious eight-year-old I have ever encountered, because what he can accomplish in these 48 hours is remarkable. And so what we see him do, right, is he goes shopping. He steals money from his brother Buzz, his older brother, takes it. He goes to the grocery store. He goes to, right to the pharmacy. And what does he ask about the toothbrush? Is it approved by the American Dental Association? <laughs> yes, he's so concerned about healthy gums and teeth. So exciting. And so he's so resourceful, right? Amazing what he can do in a couple of hours. And then along the way in this movie, right? Remember the old man neighbor? who Buzz says was a murderer. He meets him in church on Christmas Eve, and, and they, they work out their differences, and actually they give each other advice to be successful in what their next endeavor is. But the best part of the movie, we all have to admit, is when the two wet bandits, <laughs> right? They call themselves tangle with an eight-year-old. Now, they must apparently aren't the brightest wet bandits in the world, but they tangle with an eight-year-old who somehow sets up all these amazing booby traps within hours. Hours. And so we're, we're going to show a two-minute clip of some of these booby traps. Yikes. Yikes. It's amazing those guys survived and lived and could walk away. Now, what Kevin could do in this short amount of time, can we be honest, it's unbelievable, right? But it's a movie. But I want to remember this unbelievable when we get to the next story. It's unbelievable. It doesn't seem possible that he could have accomplished this. But even, even as he accomplishes it all, in the end, he still needs the neighbor. Right? In the end, he's been captured by the wet bandits. They hang him up. He's talking about biting off each of his fingers or something. And the neighbor comes in and takes out the two guys. So even in the end, when it looks like he's done it himself, he still needed help from someone else. 
So let's jump into the story of Joseph and his brothers. Now you can turn to this in, in Genesis if you want, but I'm just going to tell the story, very abridged version of the story. And so in Genesis 37, we, we get the scene here where it tells us that Joseph is 17. Okay, a 17 year old boy, and his father, Jacob, send, sends him out, say, Go check on your brothers who are tending the flock and the flocks and he comes back and he gives a bad report on his brothers maybe seems like a little snitch as a 17 year old let's be honest about the story okay seems like he's snitching on his brothers and then our author tells us that not only that but he's Jacob's favorite and so much so that Jacob makes him this coat of many colors, and it tells us in the first paragraph of Genesis 37 that his brothers hate him. Does, they do not like Joseph. Joseph, trying to get, you know, get in good with them, I guess, has a dream, and he tells his brothers that in my dream, you're going to bow down to me. I guess maybe he thought that would be a good way to mend the fences. And so he says, you're going to bow down to me. And they're like, whoa, I think we hate him more. And then he has another dream. And it's like if he hasn't told him enough and the hate hasn't built up enough, Joseph says, hey, I had another dream. Guess what? You're going to bow down to me again. And they tell Jacob. And Jacob's like, what? I don't think so. But our author tells us something interesting that Jacob remembers this. Jacob keeps this fact uh, about what Joseph has said in his dream in the back of his mind. And then Scripture tells us that because of this hate, because he always seems to rat on them and he's the father's favorite and, and he's dreaming saying they're going to bow down to him, that we're going to kill him. So they take him out to kill him, and I think it's Reuben who steps in and says, no, we shouldn't do this, so let's just throw him into a pit. Reuben goes away while he's in the pit, some Midianites are passing through, and the other brothers are like, hey, let's just sell him into slavery. This is a good idea. This is a way to get rid of him. Rip up the coat, make it look like wild beasts have gotten him, and that's what we'll tell Dad. And so that's what happens is, is, is Joseph gets thrown in the pit, then he gets taken out, then he gets sold off, and then at the end of that section it says the Midianites sold him to Potiphar, who was essentially the head of Pharaoh's guard. And so here we have Joseph alone which I'm sure he made the exact same face as Kevin. <laughs> Probably not. Okay, so Joseph is alone, and, and he's with Potiphar, and what does he become? He becomes essentially, he's sold to Potiphar as a slave, he becomes Potiphar's right-hand man, right? He gets favor from Potiphar until Potiphar's wife kind of likes young Joseph, but young Joseph is willing to give himself to Mrs. Potiphar, and so Mrs. Potiphar makes up lies, and so Mr. Potiphar throws him in prison. Well, what happens in prison? The master of the prison thinks Joseph is so great. And so he, and, and by the way, Scripture is telling us along the way that Joseph is getting God's favor. Because this is the only way this story becomes believable. Because it's really an unbelievable story. Right? It's as bad as Home Alone. But the, our author keeps telling us, like, no, he's he is getting the Lord's favor. The Lord's favor is upon him. And so in prison, he's essentially the master of the prison just stands aside, and Joseph is organizing and running the prison while he's in prison. Pretty intriguing. Seems pretty resourceful. He interprets a couple of dreams. Potiphar comes, or, or Pharaoh comes along. He has a dream, calls in Joseph. Joseph interprets his dream. And what happens then? Well, then Pharaoh takes him out of prison, promotes him, and he essentially becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man over the entire Egyptian kingdom. Unbelievable story. Yet, our author keeps telling us, he has the favor of Yahweh. And so, in a similar way, our buddy Joseph is resourceful. Right? He knows what to do when he's engaging Potiphar. He knows what to do as he's engaging the prison in the prison. He knows what to do as he engages with Pharaoh. And he's so resourceful, he knows what to do when there's going to be a famine that's going to last a really long time. But in that, as I think about this, in that, right, he had to really know how to talk and listen to these guys, didn't he? Right? He had to do something to work out relationships because Potiphar's like, yeah, you're a good dude. You did what with my wife? I'm sending you to prison. He's in prison. Like, this isn't going to be good. Even when you're in an Egyptian prison, it's not good, even if you're the head of the prison, so to speak. 
still prison. And then even as he's engaging with Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, hey, you're my man. And so he has this amazing gift to engage other people. And he has this outside help coming from Yahweh. Unbelievable story. And so if you're reading from Genesis 37, it's going to go all the way to both till they die in Genesis 50, Jacob and Joseph. It's an unbelievable story, right? You, it just, just doesn't make sense. But, but here he is now. So he's in Egypt and the famine has happened and Jacob sends the sons to Egypt. And what, is, what does Joseph do? Now, we get a lot of chapters here. He's kind of playing some games with them. Says, bring, go back and bring Benjamin back. Bring the youngest back. Leaves the money back in their, in their sacks. Looks like maybe they didn't pay, like they stole. And so we see a lot of tension there. But eventually, where does he get? I want to come back to that. Where does he get? He gets to this point where he weeps aloud in front of the Egyptians. As he's with his brothers, he's so overcome by emotion, by the very guys that wanted to kill him, by the very guys that actually sold him into slavery, by the very guys who clearly hated him when he sees them. And we're allowed 12 years after this, right? He said he's 30, Scripture tells us. So 12 to 13 years have passed, and Joseph misses his brothers. It says he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. Unbelievable heart that he has to these guys who could care less if he were alive or dead. But I want to go back to this. Joseph still had help. If it wasn't for Potiphar, right, taking him in and treating him well, who knows what would have happened. If Joseph had continued on with the Midianites, who knows what they would have done to him. Right In prison, if, if it wasn't for the master of the prison saying, hey, I'm going to appoint this guy ahead of it, what might happen to Joseph in prison? And if it's not for his ability through the Lord to interpret dream and to get favor of Pharaoh, he isn't in the position. Now, I know we, all, we always want to say it's God involved. Absolutely. But these other human beings are a part of the story, and they are still acting within their own power. And because Joseph is this amazing dude, apparently, Pharaoh, the ruler of the world as they knew it, shows him favor and helps him out. So all these other actors are engaging along the way, and God is using them along the way as he is showing favor to Joseph. Unbelievable story, don't you think? Come on. It's a crazy story that, that he has risen to where he is from a 17-year-old boy who seems to rat out his brothers and does whatever his dad wants to, to getting sold into slavery to rising to the top in every place he goes as a very young man. God is surely touching this guy. And yet, where you and I might be a little have some hard feelings towards our brothers or sisters who might have sold us into slavery when he sees them, says he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. Unbelievable heart change that Joseph must have had of forgiveness and a desire to reconcile with those who hated him. And then when Jacob comes along, I love this, right? He presented himself to Jacob and fell on his neck and wept on his neck for a long time. Unbelievable scene this must have been as the brothers figure out who he is as he announces himself and they gather around and, and, and just they're connected again after so many years and they're realizing how he's forgiven them and, and how he's going to provide for them and then his dad shows up again. How is that not different than this scene here? Come on now. Right? As, Kevin comes, as, as Kevin's mom comes home, do you remember in the movie, as, as he sees his mom and she says, will you forgive me? And his face looks like not a chance. Right? His initial face is, I don't think so. Because you left me. You forgot about me. It didn't appear that you cared about me. You left with the rest of those brothers and sisters and family members, even Uncle Frank. But you left me at home. And then he gets a smile on his face because he too wants that love of his mother, his father, but forgives 
and reconciles. And the family comes home, and they didn't even spend any time in Paris, but in an apartment for, what, two days, maybe? And everybody seems happy. Now, if that were me coming through the door, I would be like, get, get back in the car, let's go, right? But the family's just like, let's have Christmas at home. We're home, we're all together. We're one again as a family. Let's forgive, let's reconcile, and let's just make the best of where we're at. I love how that ends, what it says, and I love how this story of Joseph ends as well. It's unbelievable to me that someone who had been treated in such a way would be able to say, heck yeah, I forgive you. Now, I want to talk a minute about forgiveness and reconciliation, okay? Because I think we don't understand them. Well, I don't think I know this because every time I meet with two people trying to forgive and reconcile, one party always thinks forgiveness means reconciliation and that when I forgive, everything should be the same again. And then the other party realizes it's not, and so there's always a, a, a disconnect, it seems like. And so I want to just make sure we get these two things. Forgiveness does not always mean reconciliation, right? So if I'm hurt by you or someone, person A hurts me, and I forgive them, it doesn't mean we will ever reconcile and have the same relationship we ever had again. doesn't mean that. But what we have to get is forgiveness is mandatory. Reconciliation is optional. Forgiveness is mandatory. And we're going to look at a passage in a minute because God forgave us. There's no one who should understand forgiveness better than those who have been forgiven by Jesus. Right? We know who we were and we know who we still are. We know how we still require forgiveness, right? And so we know that, yet it seems like sometimes we are the ones that hold on to it. Even though Christ is forgiven enough, struggle to forgive. And here's what I've learned about this through my own experience and meeting with so many people through the years is, is when I am still bitter and angry and haven't forgiven a person, I'm still letting them control me, right? I'm still letting them have a piece of me. If I'm unwilling to forgive and I'm just holding on to that bitterness and that anger or that resentment or whatever it might be, I'm still allowing them to control my thoughts, my actions, my world, so to speak. And what I need to do is just be like doesn't mean I'm not going to stop hurting. doesn't mean I don't need to go through healing. But it means I've let the burden go and I've allowed it and given it to God. Now sometimes, I don't know about you, I have to say forgive day in and day out and day in and day out until I'm truly like, okay, I think I'm past the forgiveness. I, I'm not bitter and angry anymore, right? Sometimes it's a one-time deal. Sometimes it's like day after day after day. But here's the key is I need to forgive. I need to forgive. As challenging as that might be, the struggle that might be, as, as, as deep as the pain might be, I need to forgive. And as I've had the privilege of sitting with so many people who have been hurt deeply by others, the moment they let go and, and say they forgive and they just feel that rush from the Spirit, life can change in moments when we forgive. Now, reconciliation, right? It's the idea of rebuilding a relationship once forgiveness has taken place because right when when i if i've hurt my wife and 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 she forgives me and i've asked her will you forgive me i own the hurt and she forgives me it i i can't assume like okay hey we're back to normal no it's going to take time to rebuild that trust to rebuild that relationship to walk together again in that and so we can't assume that even if forgiveness has taken place that we're going to get back to where we were it takes work to reconcile we have to know that as well it takes work and 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 a will to want to reconcile relationships forgiveness has got to take place but to reconcile we got to work at it and we got to want it and we got to desire it so with that said I, I want you to turn to if you have a bible i want you to turn to colossians 3 I, th I think this is an amazing passage of what a Christian heart, a Jesus follower's heart, should look like. Now, we have a tendency to, we, we like, because we, we like to tell people what they're doing wrong, we like to live in the first part of chapter 3. Right, we want to live into all the stuff you're not doing right, right? All the stuff that you need to get rid of. We like to focus there, right? Because we like to tell people, tell, and we like to tell ourselves that. And a lot of people, right, I, I don't know why, we like to live in the negative. We like to live in what I do wrong. We like to live in that. 
But I want us to live in, starting in verse 12, or I want us to live in the positive. Now, maybe, maybe it's just me, and, and I'm hard on myself at times, but, but I choose to live in a positive thought process versus one that's always pulling me backwards. Right? I choose to live in a space that says, here's what I need to do versus here's what I need to stop doing. Right? I realize i got to stop, but if I live in what I need to do, I feel like when I work in that direction, the other stuff just goes away. Right? When, I, when I roll to what this, starting in verse 12, says. So let's pick this up. This is going to be the middle of it, what's on the screen. So Paul's talking about clothing here. Okay? So when he says put on then, he's talking about you're actually dressing yourself in these things. They become your attire. Okay, so these things he's about to describe become your attire. They become who you are and part of who you are. So put on, then, as God's chosen ones, you, you're holy and beloved. Okay, you're holy and beloved because of Jesus who lives in you. Okay, so we have to first receive that. And, and I want you to receive that because there's so many people I've met that can't receive the fact that they are holy and beloved. Okay? They don't look at themselves that way. They like to look at themselves, uh, the, what verse 5 says. Well, I'm evil, and I'm full of impurity and passion and idolatry. Well, okay, okay, okay. But you receive Jesus, so you're holy and beloved. Let's not miss that. Okay? Live in this fact. Receive this fact that you are holy and beloved. And here's what, cr Christian, Jesus following clothing looks like. It's compassionate. Cares about others. It's others focused. Remember we were talking about that, what, two weeks ago, last week? I don't remember. Last week, maybe. It's others focused, right? Someone who is wearing the clothing of Jesus is focused on others. And not just, not just you know, hey, I, I can see you, but on their well-being, right? Compassion is I'm focused on your well-being and how you're doing. My clothing is clothing of kindness. Words aren't words that hurt. My words aren't words that, that slice and dice. My words are kind. My actions are filled with kindness. Humility. Right? I'm humble at heart, which is others focused, right? Humility says I'm others focused. When I'm not humble, I've got to be in the right. I've got to be the one with the last word. I've got to be the one that stands out. Humility says I'm willing to stand in the back. I'm willing to take the back seat for others' benefit. I'm meek, not like I'm weak, but I, I, I'm, I'm meek, I'm gentle. I'm gentle in my approach. I'm gentle in, in how I address others. And I'm patient. I'm patient. I wait. I wait on others. I wait on God. And then verse 13, bearing with one another, putting up with each other. We've got to put up with each other, right? We're all not going to be best friends. And even if we were best friends, we still have like little quirks about ourselves that annoy one another, right? It's just going to be the way it is, right? I'm, I'm quirky and I still annoy my wife quite often, right? Yeah, she's nodding like vigorously, <laughs> like a bobblehead over there, yeah, right? And so we have to put up with each other. But in our putting up with each other, what do we do? We forgive. We forgive each other as we're full of compassion, as we're full of kindness, as we're full of humility, as we're gentle and patient, putting up with one another, if one has a complaint against each other, we forgive. Why? Because the Lord has forgiven us, so you must also forgive. Because the Lord forgave us, because we are clothed in Him, clothed in Him, see yourself clothed in Jesus, when something happens that hurts you, you forgive. You turn it to God. And you forgive. But look what he says in 14. And you all know this. You knew this was coming. Because we've been talking about this for two and a half years now. And above all these other virtues, essentially, what's the most important piece of clothing you can wear? Love. Of all these other things, even if you have all these other things, but it's not your number one piece of clothing isn't love, uh, you're not doing it for the right reason. Put on love, which what does love do? It binds it all together. It binds the compassion, the kindness, the humility, the gentleness, the patience, the forgiveness. Love binds it all together, all together, not just in Tim, all together as a group of people pursuing Jesus in harmony. It binds us all together as we clothe ourselves like this together as a unit, right? He's talking to the body as we clothe ourselves this way individually, engaging each other in this way, forgiving one another, all bounded in love, then love keeps us all together in harmony. 
And then verse 15, And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body, us, one body. Let peace rule here, that we become one body, in a love where this ends, just as a good reminder, and be thankful. And be thankful. Church, I want... I love this whole passage. The middle of it is the forgiveness part. I love the whole part of it. But here's my question to you. Is there someone in your life that you need to forgive? Maybe it's from yesterday. Maybe it's from 30 years ago. Is there someone in your life that you need to ask forgiveness from? Because you know you hurt them, but you haven't addressed it. Those are, those are big deals. Those are big deals for us and for others. So I want to encourage us in that. As, as, as we head into Thanksgiving and Christmas, which, are, which we know we're like, oh, these are great times of year, but, but become sometimes the most difficult times of year for a lot of people, have we forgiven those we need to forgive? And if needed, have we asked for forgiveness from those we've harmed but didn't? And here's what I want to say to you. I had someone come up to me one time, I, and they said, you know what, I need to ask you to forgive me from this thing X number of years ago. And I'm like, hmm, huh, I don't even remember. But man, did it make a difference in them and in me. I didn't remember what they had done, but they, they, they were so convicted and led by God, they still asked. And I'm like, heck yeah. And the connection that was, was reestablished in that was remarkable. So I want to spend a, a couple moments in silence before, before Kim comes uh, to sing about how amazing God is. And I just want you to seek and ask God, God, is there someone I haven't forgiven? Is there someone that still I'm bitter and angry about and resented, resentful about? And let God speak. And then ask the question, God, is there someone I need to ask forgiveness from because I, I know I've hurt them and I haven't? And let God speak. Just ask those simple questions and let's see what, what the Lord says to us. Let's just take a minute in silence. Jesus, thank you that you have shown us so much grace and mercy and have forgiven us once for all. Lord, some of us have been hurt and still are hurt. And it's hard at times to forgive. Lord, we know we need to wrestle it out with you. So I pray for those folks that might be sitting here today that have been hurt and are still wrestling, that they would wrestle it out with you, God, and be able to let it go with you, let you take that burden and walk with you in healing. And Lord, if there's someone in our life that, that we hurt and we just kind of uh, hoped it would disappear and be forgotten, and you're like, no, you need to address that. Lord, may we know that, and may we not wait another minute to address it. May we address it this day or this week. We don't know if the other person still feels it or forgot it. 
But still, Lord, if you brought it to us, Lord, we, we, we just want to walk in it. So God, thank you. Thank you for the story of Joseph, this unbelievable story. Amazing, amazing, amazing how you use this youngster to be a life changer, a kingdom changer, actually. Saved people's lives because of the favor you showed him and the assistance of other men who recognized something in him. And Lord, thank you for movies that entertain us, but maybe also can teach us. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name.